Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm with uh, Rupmati Kandakar. She joins us from New York. She is a global reporter, and we are talking today about what is going on in Israel today. Uh, it's very awful, worse yet every single day. Rupmati, tell us what's going on today in Israel with Hamas. Hello, Ajay, and it's my pleasure to join you. And today we speak about such an important event happening. It's, it's just not an event. It's a catastrophe that is brought in by Hamas. And uh, as India stands with Israel, I think I do stand by, the, uh, by Israel firmly after seeing this. So let's go to the October 7th attack day, uh, the 7-10, which happened. And it was a surprise assault by Hamas to land, air, and sea. Unexpected 5,000 terrorists infiltrating uh, Jerusalem, Israel, and uh, from the Gaza Strip, and uh, taking 900, 900 people dead in a matter of moments, and several hundreds hostages. 5,000 missiles fired in the early hours of the day. I mean, it was an attack which even stunned the Iron Dome system of Israel. and. Uh, that was uh, uh, Israeli intelligence failure, or you can say it was an uh, attack which stunned the uh, Israel uh, forces because even it took two days for the IDF, um, Israeli defense forces, to take control of the ground situation. Now Hamas calls it as Operation Al Aska. Uh, so, Jay, if you know about the Al Aska a mosque, uh, it is uh, situated in Jerusalem and it is a holy place for the uh, or three religions, Judaism, uh, uh, Islam and Christianity. So these three hold it holy. But a few days before, National Security Advisor Ben uh, Kav said that we would open the gates of the Alaska Mosque for all people because it is known as the Temple Mount for the Jews and it's known as the Alaska Mosque for the Muslims. So he said that they could come at will. Now Hamas conveniently puts it that this series of events triggered the October 7th uh, attack. But Jay, that's not true. This is a very concerted, well thought, planned, strategically executed um, attack, which, which had uh, a foreign, uh, foreign hand. And we are talking about that, Iran being the foreign hand involved in this. This intifad or the uprising that they have is not a, a meager one. It is a huge one because uh, not only did they target uh, military establishments, they targeted civilians and brutally. So that kind of brings on the point that this cannot go unanswered. Yes. Well, we thought it was pretty brutal when they were shooting these kids at a music festival. Um, people who offered, who could not offer any resistance, who were unarmed civilians, and they shot them in cold blood. It was something out of the Second World War, and uh, you know the Nazi pogroms. Uh, uh, it was brutal mass murder. Is what it was. And then uh, walking through these uh, middle class towns and villages uh, near the Gaza border, and just shooting people on the street at will. Who were unarmed, who could offer no resistance, uh, going into their homes and holding them hostage in their own homes. Can you imagine anything more terrifying? And then taking them hostage on the street. And we saw, we saw some videos of that. It was very troubling to see. It's it's embossed in my mind and memory. Those videos, yeah. of people being taken hostage, being jammed into uh, Israeli jeeps that had been stolen. So uh, it was bad enough, but now killing 40 children, 40 yes. infants, is unforgivable and unforgettable. And mm -hmm. no, no country, no civilization, no society in the world can support that. It must be globally condemned by everyone. Is it every time you think that they have gone to the edge of brutality, uh, they go further. And this is really history in the making that they would do this. This is beyond ISIS. ISIS was 
really shocking when they would behead people, adults, uh, adults. at random in orange suits. It was just gross. And it shook us all up, but this is what worse, much, much, much worse. So the Israelis uh, now will show no quarter, and they shouldn't. They shouldn't. They should exactly. They should not, because see, uh, this is not for a cause or an aim. This is losing humanity. When you go to children, you know, women also you can except to a point but children today beheading of babies was uh, the final straw i think they should get a complete uh, vengeance into this because uh, jay it's not just uh, the legitimate interests of the palestine people like iran called it that um, israel uh, the hamas attack was autonomous and just uh, completely aligned for the legitimate interests of the palestine people is this legitimate enough to kill babies and to take hostages and to uh, unfold rape, rape women, yeah, march women, women naked yeah. in the street. Um, that's really beyond, you know, that's war crimes, beyond war crimes. So Jay, Undoubtedly, this will contribute to Islamophobia. I mean, they, they say that, you know, you call it a religion of uh, peace and everything. Jihad is violent. Islam has a violent streak in it. And uh, till when are you going to play the psychiatric game and say, no, no, it is, uh, it is mild and everything. No, it is brutal. It, is, it is, does not have empathy. And Islam has always spread with the sword. It has never had mercy. So, you know, you have to accept the fact that Islamophobia is going to be real now. You cannot disguise a religion on the basis of uh, make-believe things when they, in reality, are uh, creating such a ruckus that we don't we don't know what is humanity right now. We have come to the question of: Are you human enough? You know, even Israeli forces have called them animals. That's the reason why electricity, food, water has been cut. It is not. It is not because of. Uh, uh, cornering them or anything it is because of the brutality that they have inflicted that they need to be dealt with brutality you cannot call the israeli forces harsh they are dealing with animals human animals in their courts so uh, they have brought it down to this everybody was peacefully coexisting till october 6 they did not need to do this and they did not need to elevate it to another level and another level shows you what their leadership is like, and it shows you their leadership is solidly entrenched and doing what it has decided to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a day or two ago, we saw a video of people who were in Gaza who were injured and taken to hospital because of uh, Israeli bombings. Uh, apparently, they didn't get the word that the Israelis were going to bomb. They stayed at home. This happened before in the last Gaza war. They stayed at home because uh, Hamas told them to stay at home, despite the fact they were going to get bombed. And then they wind up being killed and injured. And we have all these these video shots of these people, you know, on stretchers and hospital and all that. It's very hard to feel sympathy Yes. For the, those videos and those people now, um, yes. if, if they think that anyone is going to care about the people who are being wounded in in Hamas, in um, uh, you know, in in, um, in Hamas, they're they're not they're not going to find any sympathy anywhere. Not so let's uh, let's talk about uh, Iran because that was um, you know the issue I on which we posited this show. Um, we we're going to talk about Iran as a as a as a factor, and uh, at first uh, there was a um, we don't know kind of response if Iran is involved, um, and I don't know if there's more hard evidence about that, but there's certainly deductive evidence, syllogistic evidence that yes. demonstrates that Iran must be involved. Do you want to talk about that? So when this attack happened, uh, Tehran put its hands up and said, we are not involved in it. And the Tehran, Iran mission to the United Nations said that it is a fiercely autonomous and uh, unwaveringly committed uh, um, maneuver for the in legitimate interests of the Palestinians. 
So they give weapons training and uh, financial support to Hamas. Now, Israel estimates this support of Iran to be to the tune of $100 million a year. Now, that is huge money. And uh, we have spoken in our previous programs how we talked about the drone. Now, Shaheen is a drone which Iran has developed and selling it by the bulk uh, to Russia. That is where they're getting their funding from uh, big time. So they have got something to uh, sell and purchase everything. And Jay, Hamas is very well supported by Iran. Hamas is a Sunni militant organization. Now, Iran is a Shia country. Iran and Hamas did not see eye to eye. Now, the Sunni-Shia divide in Islam is a big thing because when Ashad, uh, President uh, Ashad Asper, uh, uh, Ashad Bashar al-Assad of Syria uh, came into power against his Sunni uh, counterparts, Hamas did not side with Iran. They had a, a conflict of interest. You know, uh, the Shia-Sunni divide has... Uh, uh, created havoc within Iraq, Yemen. So Shia Sunni don't see eye to eye. But over overturning these uh, considerations, Iran still supports Hamas. Why? They have an uh, enmity with Israel. Uh, he, their president, uh, Ahmadinejad, had said that we want to wipe Israel off the uh, map. I mean, you have uh, such a direct uh, confrontational attitude towards a country. How they refuse to recognize Israel as a state. I mean, that is uh, aggressive. So you have them not coming face to face. They know they cannot face Israel because of sheer power. So they will train these terrorist units, uh, Hamas, within Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now, Hezbollah is a Shia outfit, Shia militant outfit. That is, that is the one which on the second day itself, started firing missiles into Israel. Now, Israel, imagine on the first thing you are sorting out things on your home ground and you have Lebanon, Hezbollah, backed by Iran, uh, throwing out missiles towards you. So you have a country to face on your side. I mean, uh, Israel is facing a difficult task with Hezbollah and Hamas. These two are sheer militant organizations and they have representation on the governments. They have representation on uh, platforms like the United Nations. They have, uh, they come on conferences. What are you trying to present? These are legitimate causes uh, served with violent uh, means to grab these uh, causes. So it is, uh, I mean, the logistical support that Iran gives to these people is not overt. But it is definitely not covert. You can easily say this is Iran who is involved in this kind of funding. And the param paragliders who came in Israel today, I mean, that was a site we had never seen before. It needs somebody to operate uh, beyond the uh, lines over there. And Jay, when we see uh, the USS aircraft carrier, Gerald Ford, come into the seas, it is not for Hamas. It is to deter Hezbollah, Lebanon, and Iran. If you come in, we will, we are here. So, you know, U.S. knows how to deal with Iran. And U.S. knows how to keep Iran within its limits. And, Jay, Iran is religiously uh, dictated society. And for them, this hijab and the Muslim thing is happening domestically. So they need this kind of a jingoism that we are uh, supporting the Palestine cause and we are doing this to keep the nationalistic sentiments or Islamic sentiments of their domestic population and create diversion to the hijab thing and the killings and all that. So that is another aspect of Iran, how why they support Islam. And Jay, UAE, the United Arab Emirates, has was one of the first Muslim countries to come in support of Israel. Saudi Arabia has just come in support of Palestine, but Saudi Arabia has signed a deal with Israel for the economic corridor, which is an alternative to the belt route of uh, China. So, and you see Salman of Saudi Arabia is very competitive in seeing that who's the most developing country, India or Saudi in, the, in Asia for the G20. 
so he is concentrating on economic uh, considerations rather than religious affiliations and he doesn't want to spoil his relations with israel economic considerations are a notch above religious considerations for these progressive countries right now you know the starving the bankrupt countries came out within hours and said we stand with palestine okay but the countries who are economically uh, oriented who are thinking of progress rather than you know these religious um, inclinations have taken days to make their stand clear and they have thought about it very well so j you understand that religious uh, considerations are important but not to such an extent that they override humanity and this is where we have to leave israel to make sure that they protect their citizens and the world unites for the right cause legitimate cause everything is now not making any sense because humanity is lost so we need to understand that this is not a, a war for territory it is a war for humanity now yeah well it's it's hard to see it as a a war for ideology i mean i think it's a war for hatred um yes. and as you said it's a war for you know uh, for um, a scapegoat you know iran's yes. government has had some issues and some yes. protests and people are rising up against the the uh, autoc- the what do you call it religious government there um this is a way to change the subject yeah. Uh, yeah. so uh, and the uh, boy are they changing the subject so um the other the other logic parts that strike me is that mm-hmm. both uh, Iran and uh, Hamas have a fundamental point of view that Israel must be destroyed and yes. that every last Jew must be killed uh, and driven into the uh, ocean and uh, that's 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 the common denominator so it's a, they're good natural friends now um oh. So that they override the Islamic uh, uh, Sunni Shia are like enemies, Jay. But they forget that conveniently just to be against Israel. So that is so uh, dangerous. Yeah. So then there's this, these logic points about uh, what is it, five thousand missiles, um, yes. and still going. The missiles are still going. Incredible. Um, and where exactly would uh, a a very poor community like Gaza, which has been isolated, which has been blockaded from the sea anyway, and to a large extent from the land, how how could they get their hands on 5,000 missiles? Do they have the money for that? You know, some countries have been giving them money, just money. So maybe they could actually buy things like that. But more likely, Iran, you know, who has the technology for missiles gave them the missiles 5000 missiles where else would it come from brooklyn um you know <laughs> it had to come from iran and i think we could all conclude on a logical basis it came from iran and then you have those those uh, flying you know flying machines uh, that probably came from iran it just makes all the sense in the world they had to be funded uh, also and there has to be as you said Hundred million dollars a year, maybe a special boost this year coming yes. from Iran. So yes. I think Iran is largely responsible here, and ultimately sure. history will show that they were responsible for the planning, the organization, the leadership uh, of of this uh, attack. Um, uh, although I think they will deny uh, deny it because it's not good for them to be associated with killing um, infants. Um, it, it's not good for them in the eyes of the world. They're pariah enough already. This will uh, this will make them further pariah. I don't know how you can be more of a pariah, um, <laughs> but this, this will this will make them even more of a pariah. Um, so you know, we thought, okay, Rubati, back uh, last what is it Friday or so, we uh, or Saturday, we th- we thought that things had changed in the world that. History had taken a uh, a sharp turn, and certainly for Israel, um, it has taken a sharp turn um, mm-hmm. politically, and um, you know, in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of the U.S., even though Joe Biden, you know, uh, you know, uh, 
keeps on saying that he will support Israel. It's a different Israel now. It's a different Israel. Yes. And, and Israel sees a different future for itself. Um, you know, for years and years, uh, Israel thought that it could, it was resisting all of these hostile neighbors, and somehow it could survive. But now that's not entirely clear when you have a, a two-front war and then a, the Palestinians on the West Bank. There's more to come. So um, it's living in a world of hostility and, frankly, hatred. It's much more hatred than it is religion. Um, so I, I think we've had a, we've had an inflection point in history yes. in the Middle East, and it's going to be very hard to put things back together again. Very hard to reorganize the relationships, the geopolitical and diplomatic relationships that Israel has forged with various countries. That progress is really in question right now, including with Saudi Arabia. I guess um, um, there's there's connections between uh, what happened here and um, Mr. Putin uh, mm. with uh, Ukraine, with uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine. I mean, we're talking about the, um, the liberal world order at great risk, at great risk, where one party can attack and attempt to destroy its neighbor. That's what we're talking about. And somehow I feel there's a connection between Russia's attack on Ukraine and uh, Iran's attack, uh, Hamas' attack on Israel. What do you think? Yeah, Jay, war can never be distinguished as a good war and a bad war, a just war and an unjust war. It is war is war because it inflicts uh, a loss of humanity and loss of human lives, uh, which cannot be reclaimed again ever. I mean, it's, it's finality that is involved in it. And uh, Jay, when we see these countries which are on the receiving end of a war, we see that uh, tolerance has to take a back seat and aggressiveness does, does not, is kind of justified because these countries are now defending their just right. They are just trying to claim or, you know, they're just trying to defend themselves. Now, there is not one person in the world who can stand up and say that Israel is in the wrong right now because it has just done defending in this case. Everything was smooth until October 6th. We did not know anything was going to happen. Now, you tell me, how can you say that this is wrong or they have done wrong? Because they have just reacted and every action has an equal and opposite reaction. We know that. So it's, um, I think it should be amplified reaction that they give because a lesson taught once and for all because this would be a repetitive, it's become a habit, Jay. It's become a habit to get back, uh, to involve in conflict and get back to normalcy. Involve in conflict, again, get back to normalcy. Uh, give a few conferences, give a few speeches, pass a few resolutions, again, come back to the same point. But uh, there is no, there has to be a permanent solution this time, isn't it, Jay? Mm, that, well, you say there has to be, but that doesn't mean there will be. Let me, let me <laughs> ask you about Putin. Putin, uh, you know, he, he benefits by all this. Why? He, uh, he distracts the world's attention from Ukraine. Cool, uh, it's not on the headlines. Um, and uh, Joe Biden and the, uh, the American government, such as it is, uh, is looking at and focused on the Israel attack um, rather than Ukraine. And there'll be issues about money and weapons going to Israel instead of Ukraine. So it's obvious that all of this distraction helps Putin, so much so that you really wonder whether Putin was involved in the cabal with Iran. What do you think? Well, the conspiracy theories are so far-fetched. Eh? There's even one that China funded because they were uh, alternative to the Belt Road. We had the economic corridor with Israel and Saudi coming together. It was a shocker for the world. So China has also funded this. It is there. But uh, uh, Putin being in what Putin is busy in his war, Iran is the one who is the rogue nation, as Obama had pointed out in his list of rogue nations. They want a higher, larger stake in Middle East politics. And they always lose out that pole position to Saudi Arabia. That hurts them, Jay. 
So how do you get into the thick of things in geopolitics is this way rogue uh, Iran has done, that they have funded Hamas and uh, Hezbollah just to trouble Israel. Now Hamas and Hezbollah are just targeting their energies towards Israel. They don't target themselves anywhere else. So the first thing that the Israeli forces did was to bomb the Gaza National Bank so that the funding stops first and foremost. Internet cut, water cut. I mean, these were things which had to be taken care of to remove the outside influence. Once the outside influence was removed, they could tackle these people. Otherwise, with continuous funding and continuous uh, directions, they had a very hard time dealing with these rogues. Well, I, you know, I, I tell you the truth. I, I personally, I expected that they would do a siege. That's the yes. logical thing to do. And granted, that it it really is painful to put your, um, you know, host, put the hostages at risk, which which a, a siege does do. But I think is Israel is looking to, you know, find and destroy the Hamas leadership. And in order to do that, they have got to do a siege. A land siege, they did it today. The tankers were on, on ground today. Mm -hmm. did, did the Israeli troops go into Hamas? Uh, yes, into yes, yes, they are going. Uh -huh. They are going in. A, a land siege, a siege by air, a siege by, 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 by water, a completely isolate, uh, you know, the, the Hamas community there. And then what, though? What happens then? Um, if somebody comes out with a white flag and says stop, um, mm. you know, because before you thought, well, if Israel did this, uh, then uh, you know Gaza would uh, turn the hostages back. But that's a different uh, that's a different uh, formulation right now. Yes. Um, you can't believe them about turning the hostages back. God knows how many other hostages they killed or abused. And so um, Israel, I'm not sure Israel would be, uh, you know, sympathetic to a white flag. I think they're going to be, they're going to satisfy themselves that Hamas has been destroyed and cannot they're not do going to trust now. They're not going to trust now. It's not possible to trust now. What about Israel? Is, uh, so we, we saw that Netanyahu did damage to the democratic process in Israel, and, and people argue that um, she was, uh, he's kind of responsible because he, he made Israel vulnerable uh, to an attack like this because of all the people, you know, protesting in the street and the government was, um, you know, fighting with itself. It's just like in the U.S., by the way, there's a real parallel there. Uh, and so um, Israel is going to change. First thing that happens is Netanyahu galvanizes the various factions, and now he forms a, a new coalition. I don't know if it's formed yet, um, but but uh, you know this gives him um, political additional political influence, um, and so you know that Israel will change. The protests in the street will change. The parties who might have argued with each other a couple of weeks ago will change. Do you, you have a sense, Rupmati, of, of, of what the new Israel will look like? Yeah, Jay, Jay. Netanyahu has uh, mobilized and garnered uh, coalition support for his cause, but the rightist, the nationalist leaders are what Israel needs right now. I mean, however, however hard or tough it may sound, taking a tough stance against this, immediately he, he came out and said, Israel is at war. It's not a. It's not a, a movement. It's not a. Um, you know. It's not a small thing. It's a war. And to declare that and to mobilize troops, he's called back all the troops from all over the world, the Israeli forces. And Jay, having a strongly. I mean, I may not agree with Netanyahu on so many uh, policies, but when it comes to defending his country, I think he's the right man for the job right now, because uh, the kind of. Uh, action that he takes or I mean if there would have been a new leader without this much experience in his place right now maybe we would have had a very cushioned attack or you know there would have been 
a little bit of trembling but this person is a hardliner he knows how to defend israel i mean criticize me if you want but i feel a nationalist leader is always an asset to a country and i speak that in for uh, israel because you see jay having love for the country means you have hate for the people who hurt the country it is as simple as that mm-hmm. if you're sympathetic to them if you give them your hand they will catch your neck and they will strangle it like we are seeing for all these hostages what is happening if they had a sense of right they would have kept the hostages in humane conditions and negotiate but they are not humane right well, you know humane. the funny thing is there are some countries in the world that are not humane the yes. autocratic countries the countries that engage in this sort of thing themselves not not to this extent but who engage you know in brutality themselves they they're not going to be um, sympathetic to israel they're more likely to be sympathetic to the palestinians and yes. and hamas um so uh, let's take china for one moment yes. we don't have a whole lot of time left but let me let me ask you um when chuck schumer was in china talking to uh, one of the foreign policy people there he was trying to get he was trying to extract a commitment that they would support israel and they mm-hmm. didn't prov- they didn't provide it so china is on the fence um on this issue just the way it's on the fence um on ukraine and um and i i suggest it may stay on the fence uh this is not a moral answer it's not even an answer that recognizes the you know the slaughter of children um but that's that's china uh, self interested do you think that that china will make an exception to that you know general approach because of the children because of this gross attack or will china stay on the fence china will sit on the fence in a zen mode as always they will uh, they will maybe be uh, you know in in between the conflict but they will pretend to have a zen mode so that is the kind of uh, chinese stance we have never heard china take a stand on any of the issues that we have uh, seen jay but jay israel is in such a unique position because i'll tell you the hatred that the countries have for israel if there's a conflict in israel you have countries which come in group up gang up and want to defeat israel israel has been defeating minimum of six countries every every time it goes into conflict you have lebanon come in you have jordan join in the party you have iran always there you have every yemen uh, you know this is uh, palestine itself countries who come in to hurt israel and israel has friends all over the world who say we stand with israel but how many countries jump into the war now the jumping in of these countries against israel is only because of religious affirmations this is my brother of my religion so i will come in to defend him but israel is fighting alone six countries i mean you have to give it a thought that this is a personal vendetta uh, gang gang uh, uh, war against one country how many times does it have to face the same situation again and again against a uh, minimum of six countries for the same issue of being in their own homeland and uh, you know uh, islam was came at a later date and there way of uh, propagating the religion was to destroy the previous place of worship and build their place of worship it's happened in india in the uh, temples they used to uh, destroy the temples and build their mosque and say this is our land it might have been the birthplace of our main god krishna ram but they don't have any point and then we will have a conflict for decades and uh, eons that this is my land and this is not your land so the same thing is with israel that was the promised land as before that doesn't mean you came at a later date if you want to stay in um, alignment with each other yes but if you want to remove us from that that doesn't happen no jay so they uh, both the jews and the islam people have a legitimate cause stay in harmony but if you are thinking of hurting and destroying you will get an answer and then you think that that answer is wrong so there you have a problem when you point fingers at israel mm. that is israel's right self defense period on that i i hear you uh, saying these things and i re- remember the last war um with gaza between israel and gaza uh hamas started it uh, yes. from gaza they attacked 
out of, you know, across the border into Israel. Same thing with those settlements in the, in the southern part of Israel. Uh, unprovoked attack. And um, so this, you know, it's a pattern. And and I also remember that um, Israel, you know, used to control Gaza, but they gave it up to Hamas, gave it up to the Gazans, and then Hamas took over Gaza. And now you have a, a terror organization running, uh, running Gaza. It's very tragic. And what do you do with those people? What do you do with the border? What do you do for um, Israel's defense? All these questions. Yes. Um, well, anyway, we'll come back and discuss it more, Rupmati, because it's a moving target, literally. And um, maybe in a week or two, uh, we can catch up on the events that have taken place because we're we're in a changing world right now, and it's very troubling. Thank you so much, Rupmati Kandakar, our global reporter here on uh, Global Connections on Tech. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.